The whole country was out looking for us, for who knew where Kent would strike next. The shooting of that film was the yardstick by which I measure all other film experiences. It was the first film that I worked on that I saw that film could be an art form. They saw cancer. We knew we were at the birth of a very, very special artist in cinema. Hey. You know, the movie is based on the real character, Charles Starkweather. He saw him, himself as leading a more adventurous, less mundane life than the people that he was coming in contact with. He was executed for the murder of her parents and just everyone that he killed through his crime spree. Well, of course, this case happened in uh, Nebraska in 1958, and he was the first of the infamous uh, serial killer. And I read it that night, and it was, without doubt, the best script that I had ever read. But I had reservations because the character in the script was 19 years old, and I was already 31 at the time. I was cast in the film before Martin. I remember Terry saying, well, you know, this actor is really not right for the role. He's, he's too old. He told me, frankly, that he was looking at a lot of guys, and, and uh, he wanted to see who paired up well with her. And I said, that'd be fine. You know, I guess we'd met with 10 or 15 actors by that time, and we'd been reading the same scenes with them. And Martin came in, and, you know, us knowing he was too old, it wasn't going to work, we were just going to be really nice. He completely blew us away. You want to take a walk with me? What for? Oh, I got some stuff to say. Guess I'm kind of lucky that way. He came in, he was Kit. He made me blush, he made me giggle. The scene just took on this life. Listen, honey, when all this is over, I'm gonna sit down and buy you a big, thick steak. I don't want steak. Yeah, well, we'll see about that. One night, I got a call uh, saying that uh, he decided to use me and would I be willing to do it? And I said, why, sure, I'd be happy as Larry. And I had to get up before uh, dawn, and I was driving along Pacific Coast Highway, and I was listening to a Dylan song uh, called Desolation Row. Dylan was always my hero all my adult life, and I listened to his music all the time. And suddenly, it dawned on me what had just happened, that I had the role of my life. And I began to weep uncontrollably with joy, and I had to pull off the side of the road and just stop and reflect on what was happening. And it was one of the most profound moments of my life because it was a realization of a dream that I never thought uh, would happen to me. If I'm worth a damn, I'll pick the right direction. If I'm not, well, I don't care. See what I mean? No. It was a very passionate, kind of working experience. Everyone was, no one was making any money and everyone was there because we were just desperate to work on the film. There was a certain excitement that comes in non-union films where everybody's there because they love making films and they're not worried about the clock or how much they're getting paid. But it was so sparing. I mean, you know, there just wasn't any money for anything. I think the budget for the picture was probably around $700,000, but we had a lot of deferments on it. I think it actually got shot for about 350000 It was probably the first film that I really felt creatively engaged in. Terry would ask me questions about the character. Did it go the way it's supposed to? I felt like I wasn't just um, an actor for hire. Well, I feel like a kind of like an animal living out here. There's no place to bathe and not any place to get anything good to eat. Well, I'll catch you a big trap as soon as we get to the mountains. You know, it's the only time in my life that I knew from the very first encounter that I was dealing with a very special man. It was obvious to all of us that had any contact with him that you're working with a genius. Terry is a brilliant man, just a brilliant man and a kind and wonderful man, and it was heaven working with him. If he had said, jump off the building and you'll fly, I would have jumped off the building and I know I would have flown. He knows as much about cinematography as the cinematographer. He knows as much about art direction as the art director. A film for Terry's, it's like a, it's like a, 
an erector set. You know, you're, when you're shooting, you're, you're building all the pieces. And the script is his kit. You know, he knows what his kit is. But as, as, as you're shooting, he's, you know, there, there are other little pieces that he finds along the way. I think he loves being on edge, you know, not knowing everything. You know, he, he works hard on the script and he's, he has a plan with the actors and sometimes you just throw things off, like everybody be prepared to shoot one, one area and he'd move it to another setting. So the actors, anything that they had planned suddenly was like, didn't maybe work in this situation. I remember the, <laughs> the first shot we did, the first scene I shot was uh, out on the prairie, you know, going to visit her father. And I'd washed my hair that morning and I was all shiny and clean shaven and all spruced up and Terry came up and it was the first shot of the movie and he's looking at me and he's thinking oh well Martin uh, well now you know uh, I hope you don't mind if I do this he reached down in the dirt took some dirt in his hands and rubbed my hair rubbed my whole head with the dirt and he said oh, you just look too shiny you all right with that and I said yes sir I am fine he just he just took the shine out of me they would get everything set up for location Terry would come out and the weather would be different and he go, I want to shoot over there. And he would just go over there with Martin Sheen or Sissy and, and, uh, and the camera and start shooting and it, it disrupted all the plans that the production department had put together and, and sometimes caused chaos. But it allowed Terry to get shots that he couldn't have gotten otherwise. And whenever we would uh, get a scene and he was, uh, you know, happy, satisfied that we caught his intention, he would say, all right now, uh, well, y'all do just what you want. Uh, I'm just, just do, uh, you know, just have fun with it here. And a lot of times he used that tape that we just had fun with. And then it began to occur to Sissy and I that he was uh, uh, using that as a method to really get us to relax and be free. If you try and do everything by the book, um, you're going to miss some beautiful uh, unforeseen images. We were never able to strike a set on that film. And the film lasted for a long time. It was like 16 weeks. We'd shoot a scene and he'd say, um, hold that set. We, I might want to come back and shoot something else here. Well, at the end of the film, I was like taping leaves on the trees and painting them green because uh, it was autumn. And uh, along the way, some of the lads were getting discouraged and quitting and complaining and whatnot along the way. And I remember very clearly telling people, hey, hang in there. You're going to be real proud of this. We're making a classic, and I used those words. I said classic. Uh, there were some people that were not happy, but the ones that left, uh, I think, will probably regret it today. I just had a feeling. I had a, a certainty. It was more than a feeling. I knew this guy was onto something. I was wanting to be a criminal, I guess, just not this big one. It takes all kinds of. When you're playing. A character, good, bad, or indifferent, you're not really permitted as an actor, as an artist, to make a judgment on the character. Because if you make a judgment, it's a, it's a preconceived notion that the audience sees right through it, you know. Uh, even if you play Hitler, this infamous villain of all villains, uh, you can't make a judgment on him. You've got to be free of judgment in order to play him. Uh, so that you give some understanding, you show some insight into that character. Terry was directing me in a scene and I had to use the weapon, you know. And he said, well, Martin, you know, why that gun is just like a, a magic wand. And someone gets in your way and poof, they're gone. That's it, it's just a, a means to an end. Nothing serious, nothing personal, but you're in my way, sorry about this, poof, you're gone. Now what an image, you know. Get out! The shovel's in the truck! It was very clear from Terry's script uh, that these kids, both Kit and Holly, had an image of themselves that was way out of the realm of reality. They saw the world from their point of view and they projected themselves on it. I mean, Kit fancied himself some kind of important person, you know, who had great business to achieve. Like when he built the monument on the spot where he was captured and made reference to it when they arrested him. Out right there is where you called me. He had this image, this absolutely uh, moronic image of himself that had no basis in reality. Now look at here, here's the real prize. I must have had this about 10 years. Look at there. Who's gonna get it? Give me that something. There you go. And suddenly you become 
involved in it. You begin to care about these deeply disturbed kids and this horrible uh, massacre that they're involved in, and yet you never stop caring about them. That's a phenomenal achievement. Oh, uh, we're going to take the Cadillac for a while, huh, Debbie? Fine. Uh, don't worry, I won't let her drive. Well, let's face it, he was a very inappropriate boyfriend for her. She was 13, and he was in his early 20s, but I guess could have been those cowboy boots. <laughs> Couldn't have been the garbage route. Well, I know what my dad's going to say. What? Can I be honest? Sure. Well, that I shouldn't be seen with anybody collects garbage. You know, a lot of that was based on, uh, on uh, the real Carol Fugate, who was very helpful to Terry during the making of the movie and very sweet and who we showed the picture to. And she was, she, she was a, a good person. I mean, there's this great line where she's talking to Cato after he's been shot. She goes, is that your spider in there, in that bottle? I mean, it's just, that's not such a weird line, but the fact that this guy's sitting there, he's been shot, and he's just, he's, he's obviously dying, and she's a little kid asking about spiders in a bottle. You know, I sat, I was feeling kind of blah when you're sitting in the bathtub and all the water's run out. It does evoke feelings of very early childhood, and yet they're, she is a participant in horrific, horrific acts of violence. And just by removing herself and that numbness that she has to it all is scary. Hi. She wasn't leaving her childhood and suddenly dealing with, with murder and mayhem. She was living this sort of fantasy childhood. And I think that to that extent, the idea came up to build the treehouse, which wasn't in a script but I thought it would be a part of that fantasy, is to have a, a house that just sort of went from tree to tree. And, and I told Terry about it, and he rescheduled some shooting and gave me a day to build the tree house. And uh, I was a lot younger then and could do more. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was so much fun. And the way Terry shot it and edited it, it made it look even more fantastic than it was. Uh, because I hadn't art directed too many films, and this one was so, important to me and exciting. Um, the approach that I take to art direction is, is you know, more like an actor, I, I think. It, I, I mean, I try to complete the character. He practiced, and does still, uh, the Stanislavski uh, method of 